today's lecture we're going to talk about new chapter which is chapter number nine in chapter number nine we're going to talk about the asphalt cement we're going to divide the chapter into two lectures uh, into part one and part two today we are going to try to finish from part one so before we talk about the asphalt cement we need to have introduction or background about the uh, pavement when we say pavement uh, we imagine the uh, roads and the highways, right? But the, the, the word pavement, uh, like you, you already imagined, it's a road or a highway, but with hard, smooth, and level surface. So this surface is going to be hard, but it, it is smooth, and the surface here is level. And it's made with a suitable material. Uh, it could be made from portal and cement concrete, like this one here, portal and cement concrete pavement, or it could be made from asphalt concrete pavement. Here in this city, the majority of the roads made from asphalt concrete uh, uh, pavement. So you could make pavement either with the asphalt concrete or with the portal and cement concrete. So we are gonna classify the uh, types of the pavement uh, either as flexible or rigid depends on how they distribute the service load so uh, the asphalt concrete uh, it has uh, a, a certain criteria in order to distribute the load and also the portland cement it has different criteria to, to distribute the load depend on that we are going to divide them into flexible and into rigid uh, first let's start with the flexible pavement the flexible pavement are those which are serviced or paved with the bitumens material, such as asphalt concrete. So if your road or highway is paved with uh, asphalt uh, concrete, then we call this uh, flexible pavement. So why we call this uh, flexible pavement? Because of the way the, uh, the pavement is going to distribute the uh, wheel load. We know that we made the pavement so that it can uh, uh, resist the uh, wheel loads from the uh, cars and the vehicles. So once the uh, wheel load apply the load like this one, uh, uh, under the wheel here we are gonna have high stress. But the uh, flexible pavement is going to distribute the load over a cone shape. So here we have very high stress, then the stress is going to decrease, decrease, and decrease. So uh, uh, the flexible uh, pavement is going to reduce the imposed unit stress as the depth increases. So if the depth here is zero, when the depth is going to increase, then the stress is going to decrease. So load distribution, here this figure uh, represents the load distribution under the flexible pavement stress at lower uh, depth is higher so at the lower depths here the stress like i just explained is going to be higher than the stress at lower uh, at higher depths so at higher depths the stress is going to be lower then we have the other type with which is the rigid pavement the rigid pavement uh, are those which are serviced or paved with portland cement concrete and we know that the Portland cement concrete possesses or have uh, a, 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 a substantial, substantially high stiffness than the uh, asphalt concrete due to the high modulus of elasticity of the uh, concrete. So the stiffness of the uh, Portland cement concrete is uh, much higher than the stiffness of the uh, asphalt. So due to this high stiffness of the Portland cement concrete, the total structure of the rigid pavement bend or deflect very little under the traffic load. So under the traffic load, the uh, Portland cement concrete pavement is going to bend just a little bit under the traffic load. And this is the logic behind calling such a pavement as rigid pavement. That is why we call this rigid pavement 
because the uh, the Portland cement concrete is going to just bend a little bit uh, uh, because of the traffic uh, loads. So in this figure here, we are going to see the distribution uh, of the load uh, if you are going to use rigid pavement. So the rigid pavement acts as flexural members, and it's just like a beam, okay? And then it's going to distribute the load uh, fairly uniformly over the area under the pavement slab. So if this one is the uh, wheel load, then the rigid pavement is going to distribute uh, the uh, the load fairly uniformly under the uh, under slab, the pavement slab, not like the uh, rigid pavement. In the rigid pavement, uh, the rigid pavement is going to distribute the load over a cone-shaped area like this one. While in the rigid pavement, the distribution is going to be uniformly under the uh, pavement slab. Is the difference uh, difference uh, between the uh, rigid pavement and the uh, flexible pavement? Uh, also, we need to talk about the layers in order to uh, make a spelt pavement. We need to make a number of layers and of course we need to have a slope like this one so that if you have a uh, water from rain or uh, any source it could be discharged easily because if the water is stuck here that is going to create a problems so the the, the road it should be made with a certain uh, slope so that we can collect the water and get rid of it uh, the first uh, uh, layer is the service so the service or the, uh, we call this the bituminous uh, service or the wearing course. This one is a bituminous service or uh, wearing course is made up of mixture of various selected aggregates uh, bound together with asphalt cement or other bituminous uh, binders. So this layer here is made from uh, aggregates mixed together with asphalt uh, cement. If you mix the asphalt cement with the uh, aggregate, then you are going to get the asphalt concrete so this one here is asphalt concrete then we have the uh, uh, base course or the base layer the base course uh, serve as the principal structure component of the flexible pavement so this one in the uh, principal structural component it distributed the imp imposed load to the pavement foundation uh, the uh, sub base or the subgrade so this one is going to distribute the load to the sub base and then the sub base is going to distribute that to the subgrade because sometimes the uh, we, we we were not going to put sub base layer because sub base layer is optional if your soil is weak then uh, it, it bet, it's better for you to put a sub base layer but if your subgrade it's strong then the there is no need to put the sub base layer so if you have a sub base layer then the base is going to distribute the load to the uh, sub base. If you don't have sub base, then the base layer is going to distribute the load uh, to the sub grade. The material composing the, the base uh, course are select hard and durable aggregates. So the base is composed of hard and durable aggregates. We don't have any asphalt cement. The asphalt cement only in the uh, service layer. Then we have the sub base layer. The sub-base uh, layer uh, is used in areas where the forest action is severe or the subgrade soil is extremely weak. So if you have uh, uh, extremely bad weather or the, your, your soil here is, is weak, then it's better to uh, add uh, a sub-base layer. And the sub-base course, uh, sub-base layer or course, uh, function like the base course. So this one is similar to that one. Finally, we have the subgrade. This one here, subgrade, uh, is the compacted soil layer. So this one is the layer, uh, is the soil, but uh, with compaction. You know that the compaction, we need to add some water, and then we uh, the uh, we are gonna have uh, a vehicle with a rolling device so that it can get rid of the uh, extra voids. So the subgrade is a compacted soil layer that form the foundation of the pavement. Subgrade soils are subjected to lower stresses than the surface. Why? Because like we said here, the, uh, uh, the asphalt, con uh, asphalt concrete is a flexible uh, pavement. 
and in the flexible pavement here under the load the stress is going to be very high but then the uh, load is going to be distributed uh, like uh, like a cone uh, so that the stress here to the soil is going to be very low because the stress now uh, has been distributed over a larger area since load stresses decreases with the depth the controlling subgrade stress usually uh, lies at the top of the subgrade like we just mentioned here so uh, you, some people may think the uh, uh, the uh, pavement is made only from one layer and that is wrong the pavement is made from several layers we have the surface we have the base we have the sub base and we have the subgrade so now we are going to talk about the asphalt now we have good idea about the uh, pavement type of pavement and how they can distribute the load and also now we have good idea about the layers of the uh, pavement now we need to talk about the asphalt uh, asphalt is very old material and it's you can say that it's one of the oldest material used in construction and we need to know that before the mid uh, 1850s the asphalt came from natural poles like this one here so the asphalt the only source of the asphalt is the natural poles so we can get the asphalt from here naturally uh, however within the discovery and refining of petroleum in pennsylvania use of asphalt cement became widespread because uh, with the dis discovery of the petroleum and then the people know how to refine the petroleum then uh, the people use the asphalt concrete from those refineries so today uh, practically or asphalt cement is from refined petroleum so today no one is going to get the uh, 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 asphalt cement from uh, these natural lakes okay so nowadays uh, most of the uh, asphalt cement is from refined petroleum and we have several asphalt products are used we have uh, many type of uh, asphalt uh, the asphalt is used mostly in pavement construction it is the main use but also we use asphalt as sealing and waterproofing agents for example if you have a leak on on, on your roof then you may use uh, asphalt cement in order to seal the gaps on your roof also sometimes we use the uh, asphalt cement in order to seal the foundation so that no water or harm harmful chemicals that can get to the foundation but the main the main use is the uh, pavement construction so how we got the asphalt asphalt products are produced by distillation of the crude oil so uh, through the process of the distillation of the crude oil we will get the asphalt products so here we have a picture for a natural pole uh, uh, through which the people can get the uh, asphalt cement naturally and here we have a refinery in a refinery uh, belong to Chevron company the famous one so from the refinery we can get the uh, asphalt cement we say that mo now most of the uh, asphalt cement from the uh, refineries so the asphalt it could be natural or could be refined from petroleum oil like we just mentioned and we have three main types Asphalt, it could be asphalt cement, it could be cutback, and it could be emulsion. We are going to talk about each and every one of them. So, uh, asphalt used in pavement is produced in three forms. We have, again, asphalt cement, asphalt cutback, and asphalt emulsion. The asphalt cement is a blend of uh, hydrocarbons of different molecular weights. And at room temperature, like you see in the lab, if you uh, see uh, asphalt cement, at room temperature, asphalt cement is a semi-solid material that cannot be applied readily as a binder without being heated. So if we in the lab we saw the uh, asphalt uh, cement, so this is a solid or semi-solid material. It cannot be used readily uh, unless you, uh, you heat the uh, asphalt cement. So you cannot use the asphalt uh, cement unless you are going to heat the, uh, the asphalt cement. The other type we call uh, we call them liquid asphalt products, uh, the, like the cutbacks and the emulsion. We said here we have three types or three forms: asphalt cement, asphalt cutback, and asphalt uh, emulsion. Asphalt cutback and, uh, uh, cutback and asphalt emulsion. 
We are going to call them liquid asphalt products. And they have been developed and uh, could be used without heating. That is why we call them liquid asphalt products. So you can use the cutback and the emulsion without heating process. Uh, you are going to say that if, I, if I'm going to use the cutback and the emulsion without heating, then why should I use asphalt cement? Although we, although the uh, liquid asphalt are convenient because I don't need any heating process, they cannot produce a quality of asphalt concrete comparable to what can be produced by heating neat asphalt cement. So the quality of the uh, asphalt made by asphalt cement is better than the quality of the asphalt made uh, made by the uh, cutbacks and the emulsion. Okay, that is why we still use the asphalt cement in order to produce uh, asphalt concrete pavement. So the uh, uh, asphalt cement, it has excellent adhesive characteristics, which make it a superior binder for pavement application. And in fact, the most common binder material used in the pavement. So the best one in order to produce a good quality of asphalt concrete pavement is the asphalt cement. Uh, the cutback, we talk about the cut, cutback and the emulsion. The cutback is produced by dissolving the asphalt cement in a lighter molecular weight, hydrocarbon uh, solvent. So in order to produce a cutback, you need to mix it with a material like uh, benzene. Okay. So if you mix the cutback with the benzene, you are going to get the, uh, if you mix the asphalt cement with the, uh, with the uh, a lighter molecular weight hydrocarbon solvent like benzene, then you are going to get the uh, cutback. When the cutback is sprayed on the pavement or mixed with the aggregate, the solvent is going to evaporate, evaporate, leaving the asphalt residue as the binder. But the problem is you are going to have some gaps, which is not good for the uh, uh, pavement because the uh, uh, percentage of the voids is going to increase. An alternative to dissolving the asphalt in a solvent is dis dispersing the asphalt in the water as emulsion. So instead of mixing the cutback with the lighter molecular weight uh, solvent, you could mix it with the water. But if you are going to mix it with the water, you need to uh, add uh, in, in, in impulsifying agent because the water is not going to mix with the uh, asphalt cement. So you need to have additional agents so that the, the uh, is going to facilitate the mixing between the water and the asphalt cement. So em emulsified asphalt typically consists of about 60 to 70 asphalt cement and the rest is going to be a water. But again, you need to put a fraction of a percent of uh, emulsifying agent so that uh, they are going to help you uh, to mix the uh, asphalt cement with the water. Although emulsions and cutback can be used for the same application, so the emulsion and the cutback, we are, going, we are going to use them for the same application, the use of the emulsion is increasing. Why? Because they do not include hazardous and costly solvent. Because the emulsion we are going to mix the uh, asphalt cement with the water, so we don't have any hazardous material, not like a, a lighter molecular weight hydrocarbon solvent, not like this one. So uh, nowadays, uh, emulsion uh, is going to uh, get some popularity because it's, uh, it does not include hazardous and uh, costly solvents. So why we use the asphalt or where we can use the asphalt. The main use of asphalt is in pavement construction and maintenance is the main use. But also we are going to use the asphalt in sealing and waterproofing various structural components such as roofs and underground foundation. We talked about this previously. Uh, the selection of the type and the grade of asphalt depends on the type of the construction and the climate of the area. We have uh, a different type and different grade of asphalt. So which one should be used? It depends on the type of the construction and the climate of the area. Those uh, two important points uh, through which you can choose the, uh, the uh, best type and the best grade of the asphalt. The liquid asphalt, the, like the emulsion and the cutback, are used for, uh, for pavement maintenance application, 
such as fox sealing, chip seals, and celery seals, and microservicing. So we say that in order to produce the uh, uh, asphalt concrete uh, pavement, it's better to use the asphalt cement. But for maintenance, it's, com uh, it's convenient to use the asphalt uh, liquid, like the emulsions and the cutback, uh, like the uh, fox ceilings and the chip seals and the celery seals and micro uh, servicing. We are going to talk about this. We don't worry about that. So uh, in order to make uh, uh, asphalt concrete mixes, we have two ways of doing it. Either the hot mix or the cold mix, OK? So we know that the pavement is going to be made from asphalt concrete mixes. It could be hot mix or it could be cold mix. The hot mix asphalt, MA, is more commonly used, while cold mix asphalt, this one is usually used for light to medium traffic secondary ro uh, roads or for remote location or maintenance use. So the most used one is the hot mix asphalt. The, uh, the other one, the, the cold mix asphalt, we use this for light to medium traffic or for remote location. The hot mix asphalt are a mixture or suitable aggregate coated with the asphalt cement. Okay, the term hot mix comes from the process of heating the aggregate and the asphalt before mixing to remove the moisture from the aggregate and to obtain sufficient fluidity of the asphalt cement for proper mixing and workability. So if you are going to heat the, uh, if you are going to use the asphalt cement and the aggregate uh, and uh, this process, we call this type of mix is hot mix asphalt. If you are going to use the emulsion or the cutback to produce uh, asphalt cement mix, we call this cold mix asphalt because you don't need to uh, heat the uh, asphalt. So how we are going to produce hot mix asphalt concrete. We are going to have asphalt cement and aggregate are combined in a mixing facility. So here we have a hot mix asphalt concrete facility. This is a plant in order to produce hot mix asphalt. OK, so asphalt cement and aggregate are combined in a mixing facility where they are heated. So we are going to heat the asphalt mix and also we are going to heat the aggregate. And also we are going to have the proportion process and then are going to mix uh, them together pr to produce the desired bathing mixture. The hot mix facilities may be uh, permanently located like this one. It could be uh, permanently located. Or it may be portable and move from job to job. So it could be uh, movable or mobile uh, station. It depends on where you are going to uh, uh, construct your road, or it could be uh, permanent. In the hot mixing facilities, we are going to use different size fraction of hot aggregates, which are drawn in proportional amounts from storage pins to make one batch for mixing. So here we have the uh, uh, aggregate pins with a different size of aggregate and it should be heated here and here we have a drum where we can heat the uh, aggregate and then later on is going to be mixed with the asphalt cement okay here we have another bin for call this uh, cold feed for reclaim asphalt uh, pavement reclaim asphalt pavement it's mean that uh, the uh, it's a pavement that is already has been used when we are going to get rid of it Instead of through the uh, aggregate uh, out, we are going to use uh, using again. But the proportion should, should be up to 50%. Okay, the proportion should be up to 50%. So hot mixing facilities using different uh, size fraction of hot aggregate, which are drawn in proportion amount from the storage pin to make one batch for mixing. When the mixing is complete, then the hot mix is then transported to the pavement uh, to the paving site and is spread in a partially compacted layer with even service using paving machine. Then after we finish from the mixing process, then we are going to transport the asphalt to the location and then we are going to spread the asphalt 
and then we are gonna uh, compact the layers with even service using pavement machine we have a pavement machine uh, is going to go back and forth uh, for example for eight times back back and forth so that the compaction process is going to take place while it's still hot the remember that the compaction process it should be done while the uh, uh, the uh, hot mix asphalt is still hot so while it's still hot the paving mixture is further compacted by heavy rolling machines to produce a smooth pavement surface okay so we need to uh, compact the uh, asphalt with heavy rolling machines again the purpose of the compacting is to uh, get rid of the voids in the uh, mix and the surface is going to be smooth and level so in this picture here we have a facility for hot mix asphalt concrete here we have the, the drum in the drum we are going to heat the aggregates and then combine them with the uh, asphalt, uh, uh, asphalt cement so here we have the asphalt cement storage tanks this one is going to feed the drum okay uh, and here we have uh, like we just mentioned we have the uh, reclaim asphalt pavement and here we have the primary collector and here we have the control center from where we can control all of this process processes after we finish from mixing then we are going to uh, put the uh, asphalt mix into, in, into historic silos like this one and then the truck is going to come here and then the uh, uh, the silos is going to feed the truck with the hot mix asphalt and then the truck is going to be uh, is going to deliver the uh, hot mix asphalt to the uh, uh, needed site uh, i hope if we have a chance so that we can visit a hot mix facility so that you can understand uh, the idea better here in this tank we have like uh, admixtures also we have admixtures in uh, asphalt uh, cement okay we have we could have admixtures in order to improve the properties of the asphalt cement so here we have different uses of asphalt like i said that it could be used for hot mix asphalt or for fog seal or for chip seal in this table here we are gonna uh, talk about the different type of the asphalt first we have the hot mix asphalt the hot hot mix asphalt it means that we have a mixture of asphalt cement plus aggregate okay uh, uh, why we need hot mix asphalt in order to produce pavement service or for patching also we have the cold mix the cold mix is a mixture of aggregates and liquid asphalt this time we have liquid asphalt okay and we know that the liquid asphalt uh, it can be used without heating so that, that is why we call we call it uh, cold mix so why we use a cold mix we use a cold mix for patching for low volume road service and asphalt is stabilized uh, base also we have the fox seal the fox seal in this process we are going to spray uh, uh, asphalt emulsion on existing pavement surface why we do that because we need to seal existing pavement surface so we know that after we use the uh, uh, pavement for uh, several of years, then we are going to see some gaps on the uh, surface. So we use the Fox seal in order to seal existing uh, pavement surface, like this one here. Uh, we are going to we have here we have old pavement, but this one is old. Uh, we have some gaps. Then we are going to put emulsion or cut back so that we can seal the voids. We call this Fox seal. And also we have the prime coat the uh, prime coat we are going we it's just like spray coat asphalt emulsion to bond aggregate base and asphalt concrete service so before we put the uh, concrete service we are going to spray uh, asphalt emulsion in order to connect the base layer with the service layer we talk, remember that we talk about the layers of the pavement first we have the service and below the service layer we have the the base layer so be before we start constructing the service layer uh, we need to put uh, uh, we need to put the uh, uh, coat asphalt emulsion so that we are going to have a bond between the base and the uh, service also we have the tag coat the tag coat 
just like this process but this one is gonna be uh, put between an old pavement and new pavement if you want to construct a new uh, pavement uh, on uh, old pavement before you start this we need to put the uh, asphalt emulsion we call this tag coat so this one is going to use for construction of new pavement or between an existing pavement and over layer also we have the chip seal In the chip seal we have a spray coat of asphalt emulsion followed with the aggregate layers this one is a chip chip seal okay we are going here we are going to put a layer of the uh, asphalt then it's going to be followed by a layer of the aggregate we use this for uh, uh, maintenance of existing pavement or low volume road services also we have the celery seal this one is the mixture of emulsion with a well graded fine aggregate and water so this one is going to mix uh, emulsion and we are going to mix it with the fine aggregate so we, we are not going to use coarse aggregate only fine aggregate and this one uh, is used for reservice of low volume uh, roads finally we have the uh, uh, micro servicing in the micro servicing the mixture of uh, polymer modified emulsion uh, we are gonna uh, then have well graded crushed fine aggregates and we are going to have mineral fillers water and we are going to have some admixtures uh, the uh, purpose of the micro servicing is for texturing sealing crack filling rut filling and minor leveling uh, susceptibility of the asphalt the uh, asphalt cement well, when we are going to increase the temperature the uh, asphalt cement is going to be affected but which property is going to be affected by the temperature like we can see in the lab when you are going to increase the temperature the viscosity uh, the vis viscosity of the uh, asphalt cement is going to decrease so the consistency of the asphalt is greatly affected by the temperature and the asphalt get hurt and brittle at low temperature so at low temperature the asphalt is going to be hard and brittle the behavior itself is going to be brittle while at the high temperature the uh, asphalt get soft uh, so we need to understand this point because this is fundamental point when we're dealing with the asphalt cement so the viscosity of the asphalt decreases when the temperature increases we are going to increase the temperature then the viscosity is going to decrease uh, the uh, asphalt temperature uh, susceptibility can be represented by the slope of the line so in this graph uh, the relation uh, between the viscosity and the temperature has been drawn here this one is the in, in uh, log scale and this one is also in log scale so if you are going to draw the relation between the temperature and the viscosity of the asphalt you are going to find uh, relation like that and uh, in order to use the asphalt itself i have optimum viscosity range so if the uh, uh, asphalt is uh, uh, above that uh, level here upper level then the asphalt is going to be too brittle and is going to be subjected to thermal cracking and if the asphalt uh, below the uh, lower uh, level here the asphalt is going to be too soft and is going to be subjected to rotting so here we have uh, a picture for thermal cracking in the thermal cracking the uh, asphalt is going to be uh, uh, the asphalt cement is going to be above the uh, the upper limit for the optimum viscosity range so the asphalt is going to be too brittle and we know that we need some flexibility in the asphalt uh, and if you uh, and if the asphalt is brittle then the uh, failure like that the cracking like that is going to take place so when asphalt is mixed with aggregate the mixture would perform appropriately only if the asphalt viscosity within the optimum range so the asphalt is going to perform uh, in a good way only within the optimum viscosity range if it's more than that then it's going to uh, it's going to be too brittle and it's going to be subjected to thermal cracking 
if it's below the uh, optimum viscosity ring then the asphalt is going to be too soft and then we are going to be at the risk of rotting so here we the thermal cracking if the viscosity of the asphalt is higher than the optimum range higher than the optimum range the mixture will be too brittle and susceptible to low temperature cracking this one here uh, also on the other hand the, if the viscosity is below the optimum range this one it's below the optimum range the mixture will flow readily okay and that's going to result in permanent deformation we call this rotting so if the asphalt is too soft which means that the uh, uh, the viscosity below the optimum range then we are going to have permanent deformation we call this type of deformation rotting so we need to uh, use asphalt only within this range more than that you are going to have thermal cracking the material is too brittle uh, lower than that you are going to have rotting the material is too soft so you need to know that the asphalt comes in different grades we have different grades the the lowest grade is soft and the hardest grade is is hard so we have grades for for the for the asphalt cement we don't have only one grade we have the soft this one is going to have low viscosity the asphalt is used in cold climate to avoid thermal cracking and we have the hard this one is going to have high viscosity the asphalt is used in hot climates to avoid rotting so i'm going to take advantage of this if i'm going to have hard uh, asphalt cement then I'm going to use this in hot climate because I don't want to get rotting. If my asphalt is soft, then I'm going to use this in the cold climates to avoid thermal cracking. So I have many grades for the uh, asphalt cement. Uh, in the extreme, I have the uh, hard in this extreme. And in that extreme, I have the soft. And of course, I have some grades in between. If it's hard, then it's better to be used in the hot uh, climate. If it's soft, then it's better to use in the cold climate. So also it's important to talk about the uh, most advanced method in order to evaluate the asphalt cement and the asphalt concrete. So in uh, 1987, the Strategic Highway Research Program, SHRP, began developing a new system for specifying asphalt materials and designing asphalt cement. So this uh, research program tried to or develop a new system for specifying asphalt materials and designing asphalt mixes. And this research program produced the super paved mixed design method. So in order to come up with asphalt concrete, uh, we have new method introduced by the uh, uh, SHRP okay uh, in order to produce uh, asphalt cement using the super pave mixed design method for asphalt concrete so you know if you are going to produce asphalt concrete we have new method introduced by SHRP you know uh, we call this super pave mixed design method and in order to uh, grade the asphalt binder we have they also introduce the performance grading method so in order to understand or to classify the asphalt binder uh, this uh, research group introduced the performance grading method this grading depends only on the performance of the asphalt binder or the asphalt cement so why this uh, uh, research uh, program has been introduced so uh, in the past uh, uh, the asphalt cement specification typically were based on the measurement of viscosity, penetration, ductility, and the softening point temperature. So in the olden days, uh, in 1901, for example, in order to uh, classify the asphalt cement, the tests were based on viscosity, penetration, ductility, and the softening point temperature. Unfortunately, this measurement, the viscosity, penetration, ductility, and the softening point are not sufficient to probably describe the 
viscoelastic and the failure properties of the asphalt cement. Viscoelastic is the behavior of the asphalt. The behavior of the asphalt, it has unique behavior. We call this behavior viscoelastic. So this, this specification here cannot uh, describe the uh, behavior of the asphalt cement. That is why this uh, research group introduced new method for the mixed design and for the uh, asphalt binder. Uh, the new performance grade binder specification were designed to provide performance related properties. So the, uh, the, uh, uh, the new method depends on the performance. They are going to relate the performance uh, with the uh, asphalt binder. Uh, the viscosity and the penetration and the ductility and the softening point temperature, those tests were empirical. Okay, those tests were empirical and it has not been related with the performance of the asphalt cement. So here we are going to go through the uh, uh, new test that it has been introduced by the uh, research program. They introduced a new uh, test in order to uh, grade the uh, asphalt binder. Let's start with the first one. We have the rolling thin film oven. Like you can see here, we have big oven. Inside that big oven, we have rotating uh, circular meter uh, carriage. This one here. So we are going to take a sample of the asphalt in this jar. We are going to place it here. And then this one is going to rotate and also is going to be subjected to high temperature. So the specimen jar here is going to be placed in the container in over uh, at uh, 190 degrees Celsius for 75 minutes. Okay, and it's going to be rotated. So what is the uh, benefit for or of this test? We know that uh, uh, the asphalt, before we are going to place the asphalt on the roads, the asphalt is going to be manufactured in the plant, in the plant. And uh, then you are going to transport the asphalt to the, uh, the, to the site in order to place the asphalt on the road. So here we have a time. We have maybe like uh, one hour or two hours. We call this the construction stage. Okay, we call this the construction stage. So in this stage, the uh, asphalt is going to uh, go through aging process. The asphalt is going to age, and that is going to affect the quality of the asphalt. So we cannot perform tests unless the asphalt goes through this stage. So if I'm going to take sample directly, then the, uh, the effect of the construction process is not going to be reflected. So, in this test, we are going to simulate the short time aging at the time of the construction. So this one, you can, uh, you can uh, classify this test as a prerequisite, a prerequisite for other tests. If you, if you don't perform this test, then you are not going to perform rotational vis viscometer. You are not going to perform dynamic shear rheometer, you are not going to perform bending beam and direct tension test. So in order to perform the other test, it's a prerequisite uh, to get the rolling thin film oven, because this test is going to simulate the short term aging at the time of the construction. Then the, uh, uh, the asphalt is going to be ready for other tests like the rotational vis viscometer and uh, dynamic shear rheometer, bending beam and direct tension test. So during this process, of course, we are going to have uh, a mass loss because we have temperature and maybe some materials or uh, some elements is going to evaporate during this process. So we need to measure the change in mass loss and the change in the mass loss should be less than or equal 1% of the uh, total weight of the asphalt binder. So this one is a prerequisite test. It should be done before the other test to simulate the short aging. Also, uh, I have to simulate the long aging because, for example, if you are going to look at the uh, thermal cracking. The thermal cracking is not, of course, is going to take place uh, uh, in the 
uh, after one year or, or two years uh, after week uh, after the construction of the road this process is going to take a lot of time maybe after five years ten years so if i'm going to take a new fresh sample in order to check the thermal tracking uh, cracking then this sample is not going to represent the true behavior of the asphalt binder okay so i need to uh, uh, i need to process the asphalt binder so that the binder is, is going to be like the binder has been here for five to ten years. So I need to simulate this process. So in order to do that, I need to perform the pressure aging vessels. So this test, again, it's a prerequisite uh, in order to uh, have a test like the uh, bending beam and the direct tension test. Because the bending beam and the direct tension test uh, through this test, we are going to evaluate the thermal cracking. And the thermal cracking is going to take place between 5 to 10 years. So I need to perform this test. We call this the pressure aging vessels. This one is going to simulate long-term aging. Again, this one is a prerequisite test. So this one is going to uh, simulate the long-term aging at an age 5 to 10 year old. And uh, in order to, for, to perform all these tests here, it's a prerequisite to perform pressure aging vessels. Okay, so in this test, we are going to force uh, oxygen into the sample. So if we are going to force oxygen into the sample, uh, this one is going to uh, replicate the ox uh, oxidation aging over pavement life, five to 10 years. So during this process, the uh, asphalt vine is gonna look like, uh, it, uh, like he, uh, it has been uh, a process uh, for five to ten years during this process we are going to apply a pressure uh, about two megapascal uh, in a temperature of uh, 90 to 110 degrees celsius for 20 hours of course the temperature here depends on the grade of the binder because uh, the, the, we have different grades of the asphalt uh, cement so again this test here is a prerequisite test. So I have the rolling thing filled. This one is going to simulate the short uh, term aging. And I have the pressure aging vessels. This one is going to represent the long term aging. So also we need to perform flash point test. I think most of you have seen this test in the lab. So this one is a safety test for the fire hazard by determining the flash temperature of the asphalt. So uh, in order to know uh, at which temperature the asphalt is going to fire, we are going to use the uh, flash point test. In this test, we are going to heat the binder here. We are going to heat the binder and we are going to expose the, the binder to a flame. So this flame is going to uh, come back and forth uh, while we are going to heat the asphalt binder. And then at some point, the asphalt is going to catch uh, the fire because of the flame and then the temperature is going to be measured and the temperature here is, is going to represent the uh, flash and the fire point of the asphalt so this one is the safety test uh, i'm going to form this test to make sure that uh, the asphalt is going to be heated without any uh, problem also we have the rotational uh, viscometer test in this test we have a viscometer uh, attached to a heater uh, it has been designed especially for the asphalt we are going to insert uh, a spindle this one is a spindle first we, ne we need to take a sample in a small jar uh, a volume between uh, 8 millimeter to 10 millimeter i'm going to uh, uh, place asphalt in this jar and then i'm going to place this uh, spindle uh, inside the uh, sample here and the spindle is going to rotate. We have a special spindle for the asphalt. We call this spindle 27. So the uh, the uh, spindle is going to be inserted inside the jar and then it's going to rotate it, applying a torque in a certain time. And the, the device is going to relate the uh, torque and the time and the viscosity. Okay, then the uh, device is going to measure the viscosity of the uh, asphalt. The spindle size uh, is varies based on the viscosity to be measured. We say that we are going to use spindle 27 
for the uh, asphalt binder. So why why we use this device? Uh, like you uh, like you have seen in the lab, we use this device in order to establish the temperature versus the viscosity relationship. Okay, and also we use this to determine the ability to to bump binder at asphalt plant because we know we want to see at which temperature the asphalt is going to be bumped easily without any viscosity problem and also uh, we need to determine the compaction and the mixing temperature for the binder uh, testing so in order to compact and mix the asphalt i need to know the viscosity uh, so that i'm not going to have any problem compaction uh, in the mixing and the compaction process so this test is very important and it has been uh, conducted in the uh, lab. Also, we have the dynamic shear rheometer. This test here, we are going to take a sample and then we are going to apply a torque here with uh, some angle. Then the uh, benefit of this test in order to measure the complex shear modulus of the binders, the G star and also the phase angle here. And uh, the uh, dynamic shear rheometer is going to measure the resistance to shear deformation in the linear viscoelastic range. So the behavior, we say that the behavior of the uh, cement binder is viscoelastic, and we need to determine the uh, shear deformation, how much the uh, asphalt binder is going to resist the shear deformation. Also, is going to measure the viscosity, but the viscosity in terms of resistance to to shear. Also, we have the bending beam rheometer. We are gonna uh, uh, cast uh, uh, asphalt binder uh, in the shape of uh, a beam, like this one here. Okay, but 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 in order to uh, the asphalt to be like that, the temperature should be uh, should be low temperature. And then we are going to apply a force uh, in the middle here uh, in order to see. Uh, the cracks. So this test is going to simulate uh, the uh, the thermal cracking behavior. Okay, but before this test, you know that you need to perform the pressure uh, uh, vessel. Okay, before before this to simulate the performance of the asphalt binder between five to ten years. So this test is going to measure uh, low temperature stiffness properties of the binder. Because, like I see that, like I just mentioned, in order to cast the asphalt in, 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 in beam like that, the temperature it should be low temperature, and the temperature it should be uh, tested at 10 degrees Celsius, higher than the lower temperature rating. So you are gonna, uh, uh, you need to know the lower temperature that the asphalt can uh, work with it. Then you need to add 10 degree uh, Celsius higher. So let's say that uh, this asphalt binder can uh, resist up to minus 20 degrees Celsius. Then this test should be performed at minus 10 degrees uh, Celsius, which means that I'm going to add 10 degrees uh, uh, higher than the lower temperature rating. And again, here he reminds us to this test, it should be done after the lower, uh, rolling thin film and the pressure aging uh, vessels because this one is going to simulate the short term and this one is going to simulate the uh, long term uh, uh, of the uh, asphalt binder. So also this test is going to evaluate the thermal cracking performance of the uh, pavement because the pavement uh, is going to take uh, take place because of the uh, the asphalt is going to be too brittle. So I need to evaluate the uh, uh, thermal cracking and also I'm going to know the stiffness properties at low temperature. Also, I have the direct tension test. Like you can see here, the asphalt is going to be casted to be like that. This one is similar to uh, the test that we have we have done on the cement, the brick wood test. But this time, uh, we are going to uh, cast a specimen to look like the brick wood. OK, of course. For the specimen to take this shape, the temperature it should be low. Again, the temperature uh, is gonna be 10 degrees Celsius higher than the lower temperature rating. Okay, uh, and we use this test again also to 
to uh, measure the uh, thermal cracking properties. Okay, so this test is going to be performed after after the rolling thin film to simulate the short aging, and after the pressure aging vessels to simulate the long aging process. So now we discussed most of the uh, test that it has been produced by the uh, SHRP. So the SHRP, they say that those old method, traditional tests, viscosity, penetration, ductility are not enough to understand the behavior of the asphalt. Because in the behavior of the asphalt, we are going to have uh, mainly, we are going to uh, uh, have a thermal cracking. So in order to evaluate the thermal cracking, we are going to use the direct tension uh, test and we are going to use the bending uh, uh, beam rheometer. And also, in order to simulate the long aging, this is never has been produced, uh, produced uh, before or introduced before. Uh, uh, it, the first time to produce the uh, the pressure uh, aging vessels by the SHRP. Uh, uh, okay, so also we need to talk about the traditional test. So here we have traditional asphalt characterization test. We have the penetration test. This one is a traditional uh, test. It has been uh, introduced by the penetration grading method. We have many methods in order to grade the asphalt. The oldest metho method is the penetration grading. So in the, uh, in the penetration, we are going to measure the consistency of the binder using a, a weighted needle loaded for five seconds. So uh, the weight here is going to be about uh, uh, 100 gram, and uh, we are going to release this weight. And after five seconds, we are going to measure the uh, penetration. And the depth of the penetration in the unit of 0 0.1 millimeter is going to be recorded and reported as the penetration value. Uh, and the uh, a large penetration value indicates soft uh, asphalt and of course a small penetration value is going to indicate hard asphalt we have done this test in the lab also we have the uh, viscosity this one uh, it has been introduced by the uh, viscosity grading we have uh, viscosity grading method in order to grade the asphalt also this one the traditional uh, test this one similar to the penetration test the viscosity uh, test is used to measure the asphalt con consistency. We have two types of viscosity are commonly measured. We have the uh, absolute, we have kinematics. In the absolute, we are going to use the uh, vacuum uh, uh, viscometers uh, for different binders, all tested at 60 degrees Celsius. Remember here, we have a fixed grade for testing the uh, asphalt, while in the uh, super wave method, we are go the, the, the temperature is going to depend on the uh, uh, lower rating of the uh, asphalt binder. We have the kinematics test at 135 degrees Celsius. In this, if you, wanna, if you are going to use kinematics, then no vacuum is needing. Uh, the time during which the asphalt flows between two timing marks on the visc meter is measured using a stopwatch. So you are going to like have a tube. The asphalt is going to move from one point to another point we are going to record the time uh, through which the asphalt is going to move from point one to point two and this one is going to represent the viscosity if you are going to use the uh, viscosity uh, grading so uh, i'm going to stop here uh, if you have any uh, questions about this uh, lectures uh, please ask me